So in this section, we'll move on to talk about hair and nails. Hair and nails in the cutaneous glands are the accessory organs of the skin. And the hair and nails are composed mostly of dead and keratinized cells. The keratin that makes up the stratum corneum of the skin is pliable and soft. However, in hair and nails, the keratin is much more hard and compact. It's tougher and more compact due to the numerous cross-linkages between keratin molecules. Another name for hair is pelis, the plural of which is pili. The hair are very slender filaments of keratinized cells that grow in an oblique tube of skin called the hair follicle. Hair is found almost everywhere on the human body, except on the palms and the soles. The ventral and lateral surfaces of the fingers and toes, and the distal segments of the fingers, the lips, nipples, and parts of the genitals are also hairless. The limbs and trunk have about 55 to 70 hairs per centimeter squared. The face has about 10 times as many. There are 30,000 hairs in a man's beard on average, and about 100,000 on the average person's scalp. Now, the thing that's most interesting here is the number of hairs doesn't differ much from person to person, or even between the sexes, or even between humans and apes. The differences in appearances are just due to the texture and pigmentation of the hair. There are three kinds of hair that grow over the course of our lives. The first type that develops in utero during the last three months of development is called lanugo. It's a fine, downy, unpigmented hair that appears on the fetus. Most of this is replaced by velus by the time of birth. Velus hair is fine, pale hair. It accounts for about two-thirds of the hair of women and only one-tenth of the hair in men. Children have predominantly velous hair, except for the eyebrows, eyelashes, and hair on the scalp. The third and final type of hair is called terminal hair. This is longer, much more coarse, and usually more heavily pigmented hair. This is the hair we find in the eyebrows, eyelashes, and hair of the scalp. After puberty, it forms some of the axillary or armpit hair, as well as pubic hair. The male facial hair and some of the hair on their limbs and trunks is also terminal. So let's take a little look at the structure of the hair follicle. Hair is divide, divisible into three zones along its length. First of all, the bulb, which is a swelling at the base where the hair originates. It's either in the dermis or the hypodermis. Most of the hair is dead, so only the living cells are near the bulb. The root is the remainder of the hair that's inside the hair follicle. And the shaft is the portion that's above the skin surface. The bulb will grow around a bud of vascular connective tissue called the dermal papilla. This provides the hair with all its nutrition. This is why only the cells near the papilla will be alive. The hair matrix is a region of metabolically active cells right here just above the papilla. This is the hair's growth center, the site of all those living cells. The hair itself has three different layers. The medulla, which is the core of the hair. There are loosely arranged cells and sometimes a lot of air space. The cortex constitutes the bulk of the hair, and it consists of several layers of elongated, keratinized cells. This is where the pigment is held. The cuticle is the outermost layer, and it's composed of several layers of very thin, scaly cells that overlap each other. The free edges are directed upwards on the hair. The follicle itself also has a layer of scaly cells, and their free edges are directed downwards. It's this interlocking of the two sets of scales that prevent the hair from being pulled out of the shaft too easily. The follicle itself is a diagonal tube that dips deeply into the dermis and it may extend into the hypodermis. It has two sheaths on it, an epithelial root sheath, which is a portion of the epidermis, and a connective tissue root sheath, which is derived from dermal tissue. The epithelial root sheath lies immediately adjacent to the hair root. Towards the deep end of the follicle, 
the epithelial root sheath widens to form a bulge. This bulge is the source of stem cells for follicular growth. The connective tissue sheath is a sheath that surrounds the epithelial root sheath. It's again derived from dermal tissue and it's a little more dense than the adjacent connective tissue cells. Also associated with the hair, we'll see hair receptors. These are nerve fibers that entwine each follicle and they respond to stimuli from hair movement. You can feel this if you were to isolate one hair, say with a pin and move it around, you can feel these hair receptors doing their jobs. We'll also see the piloerector muscle or the arector pili muscle. This is a bundle of smooth muscle cells that extends from dermal collagen to the connective tissue of the root sheath. It's this muscle that allows the hair to stand up on end and creates goosebumps. So the texture of hair, whether it's straight, wavy, or curly, is related to difference in the cross-sectional shape. So straight hair has round structure, wavy hair has oval structure, and curly hair is relatively flat, as seen in this figure here. Straight hair, very round. Wavy hair, fairly oval, and they're not showing truly curly hair here, but very flat. And the color is due to pigment granules in the cortex cells. So brown and black hair has a rich supply of eumelanin. Remember there are two types of melanin, eumelanin and pheomelanin. Pheomelanin would be predominant in blonde hair. It has very little eumelanin, depending on its shade. And red hair has a slight amount of eumelanin, but a fair concentration of pheomelanin also. Gray and white hair results from a scarcity or absence of melanin in the cortex at all. In fact, it's mostly airspace in the medulla. You can see that right here. The hair cycle consists of three developmental stages, angin, catagen, and telogen. Angin is the growth stage. About 90% of all the scalp follicles at any given time are in the angin phase. This is where the stem cells will multiply and travel downwards, which pushes the dermal papilla deeper into the skin. This forms the epidermal root sheath. The root sheath cells directly above the dermal papilla form the hair matrix. The sheath cells are going to transform into hair cells themselves. They'll synthesize keratin, and as they die, they're pushed upwards. New hair grows up in the follicle, often alongside a club hair from a previous cycle. This is the phase of angin here. We can see the club hair in the follicle, as well as the new hair growing and the papilla descending towards a more rich blood supply. In catagen, this is the degenerative stage. It's where mitosis ceases and the sheath cells below the bulge die. The follicle will shrink and the dermal papilla will be drawn up towards the bulge. The base of the hair will become highly keratinized and form a hard club-like structure. This hair is now known as the club hair. It loses its anchorage into the papilla and thus it's easily pulled out by brushing. This phase exhibits catagen where we've got degeneration and the hair moving out of the follicle. Telogen is the resting stage. This is where the papilla is going to reach the bulge. At this point, the hair goes into a resting stage. This club hair may fall out during catagen or telogen, or as it's pushed out by the new hair in the new angin phase. We're going to lose about 50 to 100 scalp hairs daily. To provide some insight into the length of this growth cycle, in a young adult scalp, any hair might spend about six to eight years in the growth phase or angin, two to three weeks in catagen where it's dying, and one or two months where it's resting in telogen, and then it'll restart the cycle again. Hair growth is about one millimeter every three days. That means about 10 to 18 centimeters per year. The thinning of hair or baldness is known as alopecia. 
And hirsutism is the name given to having undesirable hairiness in areas that are not usually that hairy. When alopecia or baldness happens, when hair is lost from specific regions of the scalp rather than a uniform thinning, it's called pattern baldness. This is a combination of both genetic and hormonal influence. The baldness allele is dominant in males and expressed only in high testosterone levels. This same allele is recessive in females, and that's why we see patent baldness less frequently in females. Testosterone is the hormone that's going to cause terminal hair in the scalp to be replaced by vilus hair. So often before balding, we'll see hair becoming substantially thinner. Hair has many different functions. Most of the hair on the trunk and limbs is vestigial. That is, it is left from our ancestors. It has little present function, but in our ancestors it kept them much warmer. The hair receptors will also alert us of parasites crawling on the skin as they move the hairs. Hair on the scalp will help us retain heat. We lose about two-thirds of our heat through our head, so if you don't have a lot of hair on your head, then a hat is essential for maintaining heat. Hair on the scalp will also protect the scalp against sunburn. Pubic and axillary hair will signify sexual maturity and aid in the transmission of sexual scents. Vibrissae or guard hairs at our nostrils and our ear canals protect us against invading organisms. Eyelashes and eyebrows will prevent sweat from entering our eyes. The eyelashes can also function to keep other debris away from our eyes. Also, hair can be involved in nonverbal communication. We might color it. We might curl it. There's any number of things that we can do to our hair. Take a moment here to diagram the structure of the hair and its follicle. Make note of the three different zones along its length, as well as the three cross-sectional layers. Be sure to note the epithelial root sheath and the connective tissue root sheath, as well as their origin. And now let's move on to take a look at nails. Fingernails and toenails are clear, hard derivatives of the stratum corneum. They're composed of very thin, dead cells that are packed with hard keratin. The flat nail allows for more fleshy and sensitive fingertips. They have previously been tools for digging, grooming, and picking apart food, as well as many other manipulations. The nail plate is the hard plate of the nail shown here. It has a free edge that overhangs the fingertip and a nail root that extends proximally under the overlaying skin. The nail body is the visible attached part of the nail here. The nail fold is the surrounding skin that rises a bit above the nail. You can see that right here. The nail groove separates the nail fold from the nail plate. And the nail bed is the skin that underlies the nail plate. Now, at the proximal end of the nail, there's a growth zone where we see a thickened stratum basal. This is called the nail matrix. This opaque white crescent at the base of the nail is called the lanule, and the epinicium is the cuticle. It's a narrow zone of dead skin that commonly grows over the lanule. So that concludes this section on hair and nails. In the next section, we'll move on to our final accessory structure of the skin, the cutaneous glands.